In the early 19th century, when Niepce and Daguerre, the first photographers, took a picture, the subject had to pose for at least half an hour. By 1870, a photographer who wanted to take a simple photograph of a landscape still needed an assistant to help him carry his equipment. Looking at this complicated portable laboratory with its boxes and bottles, its platters and jars, it is quite obvious that today's motion picture camera, which photographs 24 pictures per second, was beyond anyone's wildest imagination. Photographers had tried various methods of animating still pictures. The most successful could be called the school of the successive pose. They knew that a movement had to be broken down into its successive stages. Now, don't move. Inventions like the bioscope, phasmotrope, were all attempts to animate still pictures. But it wasn't until motion itself was understood, and until it could be photographed, that moving pictures were invented. And the first man to study the science of motion was Marais, a doctor specializing in the circulation of the blood. A German inventor, Hirort, had constructed an instrument which replaced the traditional manner of pulse taking. Marais became interested in the new gadget. The invention consisted of a sharp pointed needle and a movable piece of wood smeared with soot. It was rigged up so that every beat of the pulse produced a corresponding line on the soot covered board and so gave a graph of the patient's pulse. Marais reasoned that if a movement could be transcribed into a visual graph, it could be more easily understood. He began by studying the precise rhythm of the various gaits of animals. He wanted to determine the exact position of each leg of a horse in motion. He adapted the pulse-taking invention. Instead of one needle, he used four, one for each leg. Every tread of the horse was transcribed on the wooden cylinder. Four separate graphs were recorded. He conducted the experiment at a walk, a trot, and a gallop. Then he was able to analyze the position of each hoof for each phase of the horse's gait. Marais' table showed that in the third beat of a gallop, for example, a horse rests on only one leg. Sketches drawn on the basis of the table created a sensation. The horsey set of the day refused to accept them. They were also completely at odds with the classical concept of galloping horses. Science not only confounded the horse lovers, but even challenged the old masters. The discussion raged on both sides of the ocean. Edward Mybridge, a San Francisco photographer, proved science was right. At the request of Leland Stanford, a great racing fan who had bet $25,000 on the Frenchman, Mybridge proved it experimentally. Imagine a battery of 24 cameras placed in 24 individual cabinets and loaded at the same time by 24 cameramen. 
The camera shed is placed opposite a racetrack. 24 strings are stretched across the track. As each string is pulled taut, it covers the lens of one of the cameras. The horse starts out. He breaks one string after another. The broken string automatically uncovers the lens and the horse is photographed at that exact moment. Stanford won his bet. The photographs proved once and for all that a galloping horse rests momentarily on one leg. The album of Mybridge's experiment was sent to Marais. The French scholar was impressed. He decided to try photography too. It should help him to determine with scientific accuracy exactly how a movement took place. His first attempts were unsuccessful. Although he used both the camera he built himself, as well as Mybridge's system of multiple cameras, the results were of little value. They lacked clarity. They were not precise enough. And most important of all, they did not break down a movement into its smallest component parts. Marais set about perfecting an exact camera. By the time he took up his experiments again, he had invented the chronophotograph. He tried it out for the first time at what has today become the Marais Institute in Paris. His camera demanded a special setting, a black background that would not interfere with the subject. The chrono photograph itself was only a big black box with a lens. but its shutter was so contrived that it rotated automatically and uncovered the lens at precise, scientifically predetermined intervals. showed several instantaneous shots of the horse. Here was the principle of the motion picture camera developed for the first time. the speed of the shutter, the instantaneous shots of the horse draw closer together. These webs of moving images, strangely beautiful and remarkably similar to the effects of today's stroboscopic photography, still did not answer the problem for Marais. They were too confused. He decided he would have to make an individual diagram of his subject. The oddly clad gentleman was the closest thing to a diagram. Only the strips of silver braid and the white buttons marking the joints would show up on the photograph. This would give Marais a primitive kind of X-ray effect of how a man moved when he walked. Five years later, at the time the first bicycles appeared, rolls of Kodak film started to replace the photographic plates. With the new pliable strips of negative paper, Marais took another step toward the modern camera. He adapted his chronophotograph to the new invention. A strip of film moves from one reel to another. The movement must be stopped long enough, however, to permit a clear, unblurred exposure.
Mare used a clumsy lever for this, which sometimes tore the film or blurred the image. Yet Mare's very crude chronophotograph contained the most important elements of the modern camera. But Mare was primarily interested in the analysis of movement. But to make moving pictures, it was not enough to know that a movement can be broken down into successive fractions of the movement. A way had to be found to photograph them. And this takes us from the contribution of the physician Marais, photographed here by his own chronophotograph, to the inventor of motion picture film itself, the same kind of film, incidentally, on which this history is now being recorded. The Wizard of Menlo Park, the greatest inventor of all time, the man who changed the world by turning night into day, Thomas Edison, had already made possible the reproduction of sound with his phonograph. He became interested in reproducing movement. Basing his research on the persistence of vision, that peculiar characteristic of the human retina, he invented his own camera. As early as 1888, he was making films as we understand them today. Edison's commercial phonographs were made with headphones for individual listeners. All you had to do was drop a penny in a slot and you could hear the latest song hit, sung by your favorite tenor. <laughs> Edison also built a viewing machine, which he called the kinetoscope. This provided still another miracle. All you had to do here, too, was drop a penny in a slot, and you could see the latest fad, moving pictures. Anything that moved was exciting, thrilling, overwhelming. Mr. Sandow, the Charles Atlas of his day, flexed his muscles. That was something to look at. The film lasted only 20 seconds, but it moved. If you had enough pennies, you could stand and look at it over and over again. The kinetoscope was extremely simple in design and easily adaptable to commercial use. Soon it was being shipped to all of the world, together with the films Edison produced himself. This is how it worked. The film strip passes in front of a small electric lamp in a continuous movement. A shutter revolves between the lamp and the film. At each revolution, the lamp is uncovered and lights up only one image of the film. Thus, the optical illusion of continuous movement is created. At the same time, the Lumiere brothers, photographic manufacturers in Lyon, perfected a projector for a larger audience. This shot of workers coming out of the Lumiere factory was made in 1895. Edison's kinetoscope was intended for the individual onlooker and therefore could not be adapted for a larger audience. Louis Lumiere made possible the commercial showings of film by inventing a projector which used the principle of the claw of a sewing machine 
and permitted the film to be projected. At the same time, Thomas Armat in the States took out a patent on another machine which could be used for audience projection. This new invention soon created a new profession, the man with the camera, the man who could record events while they were taking place. And in the beginning, nothing was too unimportant, as long as it moved, even to the baby at breakfast with proud Papa Lumiere playing straight man. public presentation of films took place in 1895. In a very short time, there was at least one public place in every small town that showed films. The audience was baffled by this new modern contrivance, and they came back again and again to look and to marvel. A strange white cloth is suspended from the ceiling. Spectators sit on both sides of the sheet. You pay only half price if you see the film through the sheet. The projectionist approaches his mysterious apparatus. Frequently, it is the same man who photographed the film. Frequently, it is the same machine that served as camera that now projects the film. Now, instead of raw film stock, it is loaded with developed film. Okay, turn down the lights. The modern miracle is about to start. Night after night, people came to see these films about everyday events. They lasted only 40 seconds. They were collected in an ordinary wastebasket, but they moved. The horse of Renault, Mybridge, Marais had come to life. A peculiar characteristic of the human eye has made possible the fulfillment of one of man's dreams. An optical illusion has brought life to inanimate images. Men of different professions, men from different countries, have created a new international language, a language understood by men of every nation, everywhere. <laughs> 